And I would love to encourage folks to give us a round of, of applause as we welcome Sean onto the screen. Golfers clap. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God, I've never gotten a round of applause virtually. That's exciting. <laughs> All right, before we jump into it, I'm not going to tease the sharing quite yet. So I'm going to go over some awesome Power Automate tips and tricks that I use to expedite my flows. Um, if you want to know more about my background, my hobbies, I'm happy to share, but I'd rather just jump into the demo. I'm very interactive, so I might ask some questions here and there. In fact, I'm going to start with one right now. I want to get a pulse of the room where we are with Power Automate. Are you brand new? Are you an expert? So I put some numbers in the chat. If you could please respond in the chat with a number. One, are you brand new? Two, are you kind of intermediate? Three, you're pretty comfortable. And four, it's your strength. And you can put a 3.5 if you have imposter syndrome and don't want to admit you're actually a four. All right. We're a little across the board. Awesome, I like that. Oh, we got some zeros, it's gonna be fun. So in a lot of this, we're gonna start really basic and slowly get more complex. Please raise your hand, please interrupt. It's gonna be somewhat of a dialogue and let's get into it. So let's make sure all of y'all can see my screen and I'm hoping you can also see me, is that correct? Yeah, no? Can, can you see me? Looks good. Okay, sure. Yes, sir. So right here, what, appreciate it, Michael. So I can kind of see the chat, but if you write stuff, um, I'll do my best to respond here. So I have a flow right here, but let's take a look at the context I'm in. So here I have an app where I'm storing up a bunch of instructors. And these instructors know things like truck driving. They know things like animal safety. Doesn't really matter. I'm storing instructors. And my goal is every single night, I got to take all of these instructors and I got to find out, are their credentials still valid? So I've got a flow that runs every night and it does that. First thing it does, it makes a dataverse call and it gets me all of my instructors and it gets me these specific fields. The next thing it does is it does a background check through um, this child flow. We're gonna jump to that in a second. And then at the very end, I find out which instructors are invalid. And then I send an email saying, hey, go check these people out. Their, um, their credentials look like they're expiring. expiring. So um, any questions there? Super straightforward, high level, we good? All right, cool. Um, I appreciate the few people and their cameras on. I'm just looking at your faces. The rest of you, I'm assuming we're doing well. So moving on to this child flow, and this is where things actually get interesting. So if I open it up right here, um, right here, yes, I have a few things that happen. First, I'm passing in all my instructors right here. And then the next thing that happens is I make a couple HTTP requests. The first is uh, getting their university status. And the second is I check if they live near a volcano. I'm doing that because you're all from Portland and I checked some fun facts about Portland. And apparently you live near a volcano. That's true, right? Like I didn't like pull that off some wrong website. It's not fake news. Okay, cool. So you do live here. So anyways, it checks if there's near a volcano. And then here's kind of where things get not the best. In order to find out, um, once we check all of their status, we get um, this status of like, are their credentials still valid? And once we find out if their credentials are still valid, we come down here and we pretty much create this little object. And I'm gonna zoom in a little bit to make it really easy for everyone to see. Now, I know I'm saying a lot of words right now, so let me throw some examples of what this actually looks like. I come in here and I get all of my instructors here that here's their names, here's their ages. And then once we get into the nitty gritty of it, I start to make this little object right here where all I'm doing is taking the name, taking the years, and then I add this brand new field here called credential stacks right there. And then I append it to this variable. So I got all that going. And then at the very end, I've got a bunch of these little items in here like this. Now, let's 
pause for a second. First of all, this code runs great. It, it totally does the job. But here's the question here. Is there any way with very, very few clicks, can someone bravely volunteer and ask and tell me, how can I make this run faster? Right now, it's just going one record at a time. Just in a couple of clicks, how can I just speed this up? Does anyone want to volunteer for me or throw it in the chat? No one? All right. All right. I'll give it away then. So all you got to do is come up here. If I click into this and I hop into settings, I got this button called concurrency control, and I just turn it up to 50. That's it. Boom. Now this thing runs so much faster. Like the end. That was super easy. Um, another option to just speed this up is you come up here and then remember when I had these two uh, requests, they're happening one after the other. Well, what could happen is they can happen simultaneously. So in order to do that, all I have to do is hit this plus, do add a parallel branch, and I can just pick anything I want. Great. And then I'm going to drag one of my actions out here. And then I'm going to delete this one because it doesn't do anything. And then I click on this one. Is that like a parallelism setting? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. It's just it's running code at the same time. But right now, I need to have it come back into the funnel, like reconnect again down here, because I don't want it going off doing its own thing. So if I go into here under settings, and then I go under select actions. I got to be like, all right, it's running after university. Let's also make it run after the volcano. And boom, done. Cool. We just sped this up. We just saved seven seconds by doing code that took us seven seconds. So let's make this slightly more complicated. So in the chat, can you give me a write the word yes or no, or use a thumbs up or not? If you know the select action in Power On, if you know select, please say yes. If you don't know it, please say no. It's going to help me with the next thing I'm about to show. All right, we got some, we got some no's, we got some yeses. Oh, we got some no's. Oh, 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 you're in for a treat. Okay, uh, uh, we got a yes there. Um, I'll keep it fast because I know you already know. All right, so check this out. So right here we've got all of not this one. We've got all of this apply to each happening, and it's doing this, blah, 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 and then it's appending to the array, and check this out. Ice cream. Okay, a different, yes. Sorry, sorry, Peter. No, well, there might be virtual ice cream. Check this out. We could do this whole thing. We can do, build this whole thing in one action. So it's called select, and it's, I would say, you know, I'll, I will take fighting words on this. I think it's the most powerful action in all of Power on me. If I come in here and hit select, put it right here, I got to pick what am I selecting from. So what am I selecting from? I'm selecting from way up here when I originally get my instructors. So I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to select this uh, lightning bolt button. And then I'm going to scroll down and oh, lost it. And then right here under Hold on a second. Apply to each instructor's current item. So it, I'll make it easier for you. So right here where it says instructors, I just copy that. And then in my select, I'm just going to paste stuff like that. Now, here's where I could do some fun little mapping. If we look here, for now, I'm just going to put a couple letters here just so we can save this because I want to show you something else. I'm going to recreate this all right here. So let's start with uh, TOT name. And don't worry, I'm gonna, it's going to be like a cooking show. I'm going to do half of it, and then I'm going to move on. And then over here, if I go into function here, and let me know if I need to zoom in more. If I type in the word item, item gives me a lot of power. Item is going to select um, an individual item from here for my instructors. I'm going to select item, put a parentheses, and then I'm going to put a question mark, and then I'm just going to put in TOT name, because that's what I got from the source. Um, and I'm going to click add. So where, how did I get all this? Well, if I go back up here, come on, open up. There we go. This is what I originally passed in, all this gobbledygook. But down here is our individual instructor items. 
And right here is the name of the instructor. And if we look closely at it, here is TOT name. That's where I came up with that for anyone who's confused. All right. So I snagged TOT name. I'm going to come down here, and then obviously I did that. And then perfect. So I'm going to repeat the exact same thing, and I'm going to do it for all of this stuff right here. So instead of me sitting here and doing all that for you, I've already done it right here. So I, you wouldn't have to see me type all that. So now if you look down here, it's done. It, it's the same thing. Here's the status. Here's everything else. I'm also going to delete this because of no use. And then I'm going to hit save. So if I run this again, which I don't need to run it because I already have it right here. If we scroll down and under ignore right here, I said faster than a loop. Look at that. Here's the original data I passed into it. All that stuff I showed earlier. And at the end, boom, TOT name, years of company, years ago, all that stuff. Exactly the same as this, exactly the same as all of this code. I just now can, in this one tiny select action, I am doing what this is doing, what this is doing, what this is doing. And now I can A, delete all of this, and I can go delete my variable. So not only did we save time, because this, by the way, runs in seconds. If we go back up here, this took right here of the um, for this took two seconds to run. Two seconds to run six records. If I have like 50 records, it could take like 30 seconds. Um, and even with the concurrency, it runs faster, but it will never run as fast as zero seconds. So less code and much faster. Cool. Okay. I can tell you're not that impressed. Let me show you something else here we can do with select. So check this out. This gets into some software principles. Let's pretend here that uh, Peter wrote this code and this code works beautifully. And then um, Lucas decides to use some of this code. Uh, this is where Copilot can optimize the flow for us. Yes, I wish Copilot was amazingly good at making power automated actions. Um, it's going to get there, though, Arnold. I, I bet it will. Um, all right. So, anyway, uh, what did I say? Uh, Peter wrote all this code, and then Lucas wants to start consuming stuff. So, if we go back into our parent flow way back here at the start of our story, we run this code and we it runs every night. We get our instructors, we pass it down to the code Peter wrote. And then now Lucas wants to consume it down here. And right now the code is running great. So the only thing he's doing is there are a total of blank invalid instructors. The first instructor is Let's let's actually open that. The first instructor is, and then I put the TOT name from early. So what does that look like? So you can actually see an example. Come down here. There are a total of six invalid instructors. The first instructor is off going to be cool. Well, let's do something else. Let's add some stuff. Uh, the first instructor is that um, Ahmed and their years years at the company is. I'm going to save that and. Let's go, how do I get the years? Well, let's go up here, open up, check EDU creds. Here's what it gives back to us, TOT name. Let's go to years at company. Cool. And their years at company is this. And I'm gonna hit this expression. And in fact, I'm kind of a cheater. So I'm gonna not rewrite it again. I'm just gonna copy the expression I had earlier. And then in here, whoops, if I select the expression, Paste it, get, get rid of this stuff. And instead of TOT name, I'm going to do TOT years, whoop, years at company. I think I spelled that right. We can check in a second and hit save. In fact, we're going to find out if I spelled that right because I'm going to rerun this once it's done saving. All right, let's, let's go. It's going to run again. If I save this the right way, I'm going to see that uh, the instructor is Habib and then Rahmed and then good. They're very cool. There we go. There's Saiju. So it, again, pick the first one. And then their years at company is nine. Cool. So oh, you can't see it. Years at company is nine. 
There it is. All right. So here is a common mistake I see. When code gets big, and there are a lot of people working on it, like Peter and Lucas, this is where best practices can really save your bacon. Let me show you. Right here, if Lucas is consuming this code, let's say Lucas wrote this parent flow, this reoccurring one, and then Peter helped him and wrote the child flow. Lucas is going to come here and think, all right, the years the first instructor is side two, their years at the company is nine. Great. You know what? I also want to show the instructor's age. And why shouldn't he be able to show the instructor's age? Because over here, he has that option. It's right there, POT age. So I should be able to show this. And also, if we look down here, if we look at what he passed to the flow, so the information Lucas gave Peter is all of this stuff, and one of the options is age. So you would think that you could just show it here. So Lucas is gonna come up here and say, all right, and their age is, and again, I'm gonna copy this. And then I'm going to paste it here. And then let's do the T-O-T-H. All right, under here, cool. And I'm gonna get rid of this question mark to prove my point. Great, let's hit save. So I'm gonna rerun this. In the chat, please tell me what you think is gonna happen right here. When I rerun this, you have about however long it takes for this to run, so let me know what you think is gonna happen. Is it gonna work? Is it gonna break? Is it gonna do something new? We'd we'll love to hear. Error, all right. Well, Scott nailed it. We got the error unable to tap with his blah, 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 blah. Can't be evaluated because look, the property age doesn't exist. Yeah, age doesn't exist. That what that doesn't make any sense. And this is where Lucas would be furious at Peter because Lucas would be thinking, Peter, I just gave you this information. Why did you suddenly remove a bunch of stuff? If I gave you a box and I said, hey, can you go put some new toys in this box? When you give me the box back, I expect the same stuff to still be in that box. So this gets into a really important uh, best practices concept. It's called the open close principle. It means that items should be open for extension, but closed for modification. And modification means you can't be deleting stuff. You can expand it, you can add new things like uh, TO3 credential steps, that's brand new. That was not part of the original, that's great. You can add, but you should not be able, you should not be deleting this kind of stuff. This is like, a lot of times as your applications get really big, this is gonna be critical to pay attention to. So how do you resolve it? Well, you resolve it, again, using the most powerful expression, uh, action power automate, you use the select, but we already use the select. You use the select a little differently. Let me show you. If we make another select, and this time we come down here and from the array, we select the, go back to what we were pulling in from. Actually, I'm just gonna pull it from this one, copy it. Let's snag that. If we come down here, paste that here, our automate thinks we want to do this matching key thing. We don't have to. If we press this button here, it's called switch to this mode. Watch this. If I go into this function expression and I go in here and I type in add property, what add property lets me do is it says, oh, you want to add a property to this. Okay, I'm not going to touch all the other stuff you already had. I'm just going to add something new. So the first thing I have to do is type an item. And then what do I want to name that property? Well, I'm going to name it TOT credentials. And then the last thing I want to do is, well, what's the value? Well, the value, as we already know, is from our content from earlier. It is our where credential status. So I put that in here and I hit add. And then I hit save. And then again, kind of like a cooking show, uh, it's already available for me here. So I did it right here, select not dropping things. 
So remember, in this version of select, I pass in all of this beautiful stuff here. And then I have like TOT age. I have all these amazing things. But then here, age is gone. Watch this. When I did that new one with add property, if I go in here, here's my original stuff. And look, uh, no credentials yet. Look what I get outputted. Here's all my stuff again. And at the very bottom right here, TOT credential status. There it is. So I added to it. Now um, Peter is going to be, well, actually, I'm going to show it to you. I'm not going to talk about it. If we go down here and in our final results, instead of doing that uh, variable thing, I'm going to output what we had earlier, which was select not dropping stuff. And then in here, I'm going to save it. And then now I'm going to rerun it. Uh, okay. Is there a code JSON view for the whole solution flow? Um, yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll totally share it with you. Um, if we hop down here, and then let's kind of rerun this. Hopefully this time, our flow is going to pass because now we actually have that age option available there. Oh, on an internet. All right, let's see. Uh, from property must be a property set. But all right, that's probably because I'm like returning the wrong thing down here. Ah, yes, I'm doing the wrong thing. That that that's on me. Uh, that would be here. Let's do the here. All we have to do instead of doing this particular outputs, let's change it up, and then do the select not dropping stuff uh, output. I think that that's the one we wanted. All right, and we're gonna run it again. So, and I really need to get rid of that apply to each because that's still just slowing this thing down. Oh, look, it's green. So that means if I go down here to my email body, the instru the first instructor, Akbar Habib, and they're using the company seven, and their age is thirty one. Lovely, we got it. All right, this next demo is going to jump into, it's going to be a little choose your own adventure because there's something I'm excited about because I want to show you with the graph API or I can show you more stuff with select. So do we want API stuff or do we want select stuff? Can you please write in the chat? Uh, that's going to decide what we do next. Brad, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. You picked the one I was kind of like pushing you to see. All right, let's take a look. And this is great because this demo is much less polished. So I'm going to be a little wild, wild west with it. I was a little preparing it earlier today because I figured out how to do this. So in this one right here, I'm going to show you all this flow. And first, we got to go into the context of what I'm even trying to do. That's beautiful. So right here, I got this flow not connected to anything we've talked about. This is purely a situation where in here, in this Compose, I got a bunch of activities here. Remember that activity, how we were talking about, I have all these instructors? Well, here's all the things the instructors could teach. They got tennis, they got ice skating. You know, I'm gonna just change to ice cream because somebody mentioned that earlier. And then I got soccer, I got all kinds of stuff. And then what I have to do is I have all these files in SharePoint. Um, and what I want to do is I'm gonna grab those files, and I, and by the, sorry, by grab those files, I mean grab one particular file. Which file am I talking about? The file that I'm talking about is this one right here. All it is is a little table. Why don't I zoom in here? It's a little table that just stores all my records. So I want to go take everything that's in here, all the ice creams and the sockers. I want to take them and I want to populate them right here. So. The first way to do it is with an apply to each. And as we know, that's going to move very, very slow. And so some people are like, oh, but Sean, I was paying attention at the beginning. I can do concurrency, and I'm going to make it run 50 times as fast. And I'm going to save that. So let's see what happens. So in fact, I'm going to put this out here, and we're going to watch this get populated in real time. So let's go right here. I think I have a run of it. Yes, I do. Cool. And let me rerun this flow. All right. It's doing its thing. Ah, we missed the demo. Sorry, guys. There, there it is. They're coming in here. 
And yeah, they're cool. They have here. Oh man, I didn't move my screen backwards. So that's pretty fast. Like that's impressive. If this works for you, that's cool. Um, here's a question for you. Let's 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 practice some counting. The numbers 13, 14, 15, 27, 44, 32. Yeah. That's the downside of when you do the concurrency is it takes, instead of looping one by one, it loops in 50 at a time, which means you're not even sure of the order anymore. That's kind of one downside when you're working with uh, con concurrency control. So how do we get around that? First off, I'm going to go here and delete all of these uh, so we can actually see it fresh in a second. And then let's put it back up here. And then let's see a uh, different one. So if we hop into here, uh, what we notice too is that, let's see, did, did I have it open here? One second. Let me make sure I, I didn't have it. We have something called the Graph API. The Graph API is super powerful. So it pretty much gives you the ability to do so much that Power Automate can. For instance, with Excel, I have add a row and actually let's go to go take a look at what I'm even talking about. So if we come up here to add actions and I just type in the word Excel. And then we zoom in a little bit. I have Excel online business team more. What can I do? I can get worksheets. I can run a script. I can update a row. I don't have anything that's like, hey, don't update one row. Don't create one row. Create like 50 rows. I don't have any of those options here. However, if I go to the Graph API, Graph API Excel, and I go in here, and just go, just take a quick, quick look. See here, I get a lot more options here of what I can do. I can list worksheets. I can get a new worksheet. It looks similar to what's in Power Automate, but it gives you a lot more options. So, if I can get nerdy for a second, all Power Automate is is it's just doing this stuff right here behind the scenes. That's all it's doing. Um, however, all of this stuff is not available in Power Automate because Power Automate is always trying to catch up and use all these tools, but there's always new ones coming out. And some of them, like what I'm about to show you, is too tricky for Power Automate and they haven't built it yet. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the Graph API option to send records in bulk to Excel. So how do we do that? If we come up here and we type in something called invoke an HTTP request. And if we scroll down here and here it is, HTTP Microsoft Entra ID, and you want to pick pre-authorized. If I go on here on invoke an HTTP request, you're going to see an option like this. And here's what's really cool is this gives me a lot of power here. I can already start using these methods. By the way, you might have a situation where you have to change your connection. Uh, I just want to warn you of that. How you do that is you do it right here. I this is the first time I used it. Anyways, let me speed this up. So if we go down and I'm going to show you a finished example. I have, and I'll move over here so we can actually see it run. All right. I have right here an HTTP action where it goes to the Graph API and it searches for um, any SharePoint sites that have video vault in the title. This right here, this ability to search based on sites, I'm already like in Power Automate, I can't do that, but I can do that with um, the, the Graph API. The other things I can do is I can come in here and I can say, oh, I can get all of the items in my SharePoint folder. Power Automate already has that, not very impressive. I can get all workbooks, okay? That same as Power Automate, not very impressive. However, what it does have that is very impressive is this one right down here. And let me zoom out a little bit so it's easier to see. I have this thing where I can append items to a workbook. So all I have to do is create this little object here. And what it's going to do is send a big request to the Graph API and create 50 records all in one go. And if you're wondering how I built all this, well, all you have to do is either use some of the actions that I put right here, or 
depending on how you build your power automate flow, you might already have the whole path to your share point folder. It, it really depends on what you do. All right, so I'm gonna save, I'm gonna put this right here and I'm gonna hit save so we can actually run it this time. And then in here, where is, hold on, where, where is my, there it is, all right. I'm gonna put this out here so we can actually see it. And then let's run this. I believe I saved it and let's go. And then we're gonna see how this does against my actual uh, item right here. I did notice when up, boom, did you see it? Dunzo, oh wait, oh, you know what? It's cause I forgot to turn off the, uh, this thing, sorry y'all. Let me, let me, let me disable that. All right, so did it move here? Uh, let me zoom out here. I missed that piece. Sorry to get you all excited for no reason. All right, let's put that there. Let's save it. And we're going to try this one more time. All right, we have that here. Uh, and let me delete this. Cool. That's deleted. And then now, hopefully, if we take this and then we rerun it, it'll appear. Now, I've noticed that when I've done this, oh, boom. OK, that was very, very fast. All right, so are my numbers in order? Yes, they are. Uh, right here, all in a beautiful order. And then now, um, yeah, that worked lickety split. Now, here's a question for you. Obviously, using the method I just showed here is a bit more complex. So you got to start asking yourself from like a maintainability standpoint, is this worthwhile for your team to be architecting solutions like this? Um, yes and no. It, it really depends on like uh, the capability of your team and then like how long they've been working with Power Automate. This is just one of those options that if you need something to run ASAP, here's one. All right, well, let me show you my favorite demo right here because this is the one that I literally discovered in the last two days and I've noticed has so much confusion online. If you wanna do this, like create uh, batch records data verse and you type the power automate right here, uh, there's a bunch of people who are having a really hard time with it. There's no one that I've seen, no article that like properly shows how to do it. It's people guessing at it. They're all doing the like apply to each thing. Here's a way you can do it with not the graph API, but something else. It's called the web API. So if I go to create a uh, batch records dataverse and I type in web API, I have this um, documentation here. And right here, this allows me to create 50 records at a time in Dataverse. So if you don't really, if you're not following me here, let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. So this is all my graph API stuff. Let me show you the actual other demo. All right, so right here, beautiful, okay, yeah. Dataverse graph, yeah, cool. So here's what I got going on. Right here, I am getting a bunch of files from SharePoint. I'm getting a bunch of documents. And then I'm going in here and I'm adding a row. I'm creating tasks out of them. So I'm doing this. Go through SharePoint for every item in SharePoint. Go and create the record here. So that's lovely. I can do it this way. Uh, but here's the thing with this. This is kind of slow. But what I can do is if I get access to the web API, I can build this kind of thing. Now, I know this looks intimidating, but we can totally do it together and it's going to be fine. So watch this. All we're going to do is instead of doing this apply to each, we are going to come up here and do my second favorite action, invoke an HTTP request. Come down here and then again, pick the same one as earlier. And then what am I going to actually put down here is if I hop down and I all I need to do is select this text right here. 
where did I get this next? Well, it's right here. If we go down here, it's this. It's exactly what the documentation tells me to do. Copy this, and then let's pop it in right here in the new one I'm making. And I know it's a patch request, so go in here and then go like that. We're done here. Again, I didn't even have to put the full path. I just had to do this. And then the next part is I got to put in all my headers. So what headers am I putting in here? Well, I'm going to make it a little easier on you. So here is what was in that post I just showed you. And just so everyone can follow, I'm going to tab this here. And then we're just going to go down here and copy. It. Again, I'm just going to speed this up. And if this isn't big enough, please let me know. But that should be big enough for you all to see. So first things first, O data, O data max version. And then I come down here and I put 4.0. Oh, cool. What's the next one? O data version. All right. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to copy this stuff word by word. But where it gets weird is the very last one. So let me show you a finished version of this. So if I go back up here. And I'm just going to get rid of this. By the way, is my speed all right? Am I talking too fast? Or are we good? I can definitely slow it down. All right. I'm going to assume silence means I'm my speed's all right. All right, good. Thank you. So I can come down here, and this is what I end up doing. Like, look, look, it's just a one-for-one -one match. If none, now, blah, 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 everything is the same. Here's the only one that's uh, a little weird. So if I go here, I'm, I'm going to get rid of this. You'll see right here that says enter valid JSON. I have to type in this, but it has quotes in it. So here, this value right here, this is your responsibility to create. Do, do not just like copy this value. You're going to have to make your own GUID. A GUID is like a unique number. But we're going to make that in a second. So here I have... I copied this word for word, boundary, blah, 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 age, one, two, three, three, and this messed me up for a while. To get around this enter valid JSON error, you, all you have to do is just come up here and escape the quotes. And then boom, it goes away. That's it. Right? So, but how are we going to build this piece right here? Well, all we have to do is come up here, and I made a compose. And in the compose, all I did was hop into the expression. I typed in the word goo in lowercase, parentheses, click add, we're done. And then if you want to see what that actually looks like, it looks like that. Boom. Exactly the same as, not exactly the same, but it's the same. I now have a unique identifier. Very, very cool. So I got that done. And I'm going to go come down here and add it. So instead of, one, two, three, three, whatever. I'm going to go use the actual GUID. Uh, where'd it go? There it is. Or batch, I use what, I, what it's called. So I'm going to do that, hit save. And then the next thing, and this is where it's bananas, but don't worry, it's not as tricky as it seems. This right here, line by line, batch and then GUID, it's literally the same as this thing. We're just repeating. Cool. Content type, content transfer, like who cares? It's just this is just repeated everywhere. So, okay, it's just a repeat. So that's not even important. The only thing that really matters is this right here, this right here. Because here, all you you have to tell it which table am I talking about, and you have to use the um the schema name, and then what columns are you talking about? Now again, let's see this um from the what's it called? From the data per side. So if I come over here and then tell me I have a solution open somewhere. Do I have a solution open? Uh, I don't have a solution open. All right, let me hurry up and get one open. I'm going to back up here and then go under solutions. And then let's see how fast we can get this open. All right. You know what? I'm gonna, if, if you want further explanation on this point, I, I'll come back to it because I don't want to wait so long for this to open up right here unless it's going to be right here and ready. And do I clap? Oh, nope, I don't have it. All right. I don't have the task, uh, the tasks table here that I want to show you. Oh, there it is. Never mind. I appreciate you all dealing with that. All right. So here's my task table. How do I find out this task's name right here? Well, all you have to do if you go into properties, there's task, there's the formal name, let's go down here, and there's the logical name. 
So then that's going to help you find what is the actual name of this table behind the scenes. Next thing, things like subject, blah, 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 where that come from? Well, if we go down here, here's my subject column. And then in here, there's my subject column. And if I open that up, now if you've never used Dataverse, again, happy, just connect with me later. I can break down further what I'm doing. I'll also be having a YouTube video on this. That's going to be uh, a lot more uh, explanatory than what I'm doing now. Here, I'm moving pretty quickly. So down here, if I open up advanced options, um, there, subject, schema name, subject, subject, regarding, I, again, this is just a field for field map. And if you're a little confused what's happening here, let me show you one more way. If we go down here to add a new row task, I'm sure you're all familiar if you use this in Power Automate. Here I'm taking the SharePoint name, putting in subject, and I've got all these fields and stuff here. Watch this. If we click on code view, this is what's happening behind the scenes in Power Automate. Check this out. Subject, cool. And then let's go down here to where's regarding, regarding, oh, regarding accounts. So I'm just going to put one, two, three, four. And then let's go to the code view. And if we go down here, look at the subject, subject, regarding option account, bind, regarding options. It's the same thing. I'm literally just recreating everything that Power Automate is doing, but it's happening right here. So what that actually looks like in um, code is if we close this up, and then instead of uh, doing this add a new row task thing, I append to a variable. And what am I appending? Well, let's look here. It is the same thing as, as this. Look, I have batch and then the good. Where's the batch, good, constant type, constant transfer, constant type, constant transfer. This is all exactly the same. And I have to just keep doing that. I recreate, I keep on, I take this variable and I keep adding the same thing until I have everything that I want. So I pass one batch here, task two batch here. I'm going to use the SharePoint name and everything. Let me show you an example in here. Up, oh, hold on. And back up. Oh, apply to each. Append the string. Okay, and this one I have my subject is uh, this file that's called logo files for my company, which I have not advertised at all yet. So I'm proud of myself, but I'll talk about it at the end if you're interested. Um, we come down here. I have a file called PNGs. I got this is this this is all I'm doing is I'm looping all my documents in here, and then once I come down here, I at the very end what I have built for me is this same thing. I just I just recreated this and then I put it in here. And then the final step, let me zoom up, go here. I just put that in here into the body of the request. So if I take this and then um I haven't actually tested this code. So we're we're gonna try. I do have a working version set in case this totally fails, but I feel like this is a pretty Cavalier Cowboy group, so we're going to try it out. First thing is, I'm going to disable the uh, fake version, so that way this is actually going to run. And we're going to see what happens. This might be a complete disaster. Um, all right, so we got this done. Got this here. Let me make sure this is turned off. Um, yeah, we will. And do I have anything in here? Yes. This is this is the backup in case it doesn't work. All right, let's let's try it. I'm going to go down here. And resubmit. All right, it's going to SharePoint, doing its thing. It's building my batch request here. And again, this you should totally do the um, what's it called? The uh, run concurrently, so that way, uh, because you don't care what order uh this is in. This doesn't matter because you just want to make records. And make a request, uh, totally got no idea if it worked. Um, we sent all this stuff to Adverse. Let's see if we scroll up and then I'm gonna refresh. Boom, it totally worked. I uh, I didn't know that was gonna happen, so I'm kind of proud of myself. Uh, I didn't test it, there we go. I just made 20 records in a literally, uh, maybe in one request right here. Now 50 times of this running and there. Um, 
I hope you're priced because literally this demo doesn't exist anywhere on the internet for probably another day or so until I make the video, at least that I've been able to find. Um, yeah. So Tina, how am I doing on time? Is she is she here? I think. Oh yeah, yeah, you're doing pretty good. The floor is yours until you know. Usually we don't go any longer than seven. Is the only thing. Okay. So about another uh, fifty-five minutes. Fifty-five minutes. Okay, cool. I've got um one more thing I want to show y'all. Um, thanks, Tina. Um, it's because again I'm in EST time, so it's a little off. Uh, cool. So we got to that. Very excited. I'm very happy I got to show you that. There's one more thing. If we go back to Power Automate and again select just the most glorious action in the world, I want to show you one more thing with it that I think. You can start using like tomorrow. I use this probably more often than anything. Like Graph API a little bit I use when I have to, but this is honestly one of my favorite things. All right. So right here, if I go into, I'm gonna have to open it up. Uh, but yeah, let me open up this flow right here. Uh, and if I can right now just quickly do a commercial break, I'm gonna keep this under 30 seconds. Uh, I got a little training company, but I got one. It's like me, a couple other people, and all we do is train people to become uh, solutions architects. So my pretty much goal for you or anyone who joins is I want to help you either make more money or go be very important at your job. And to me, that involves becoming a solutions architect. Our price is pretty crazy. It's pretty much pay what you think you can, and that's it, because I know people are in all kinds of situations. So you can pay what we ask for, or you can pay what fits you best. Just uh, message us. I'll pop the link here. Uh, it's my favorite thing to do is help people become very talented at their job in the Power Platform. Um, cool. And I think that was less than 30 seconds. All right. So back to uh, this demo I wanted to show you. Right here, we have this other step in our parent flow that I didn't have time to fully show all of you, which is this um, run a child flow, get instructor languages. So remember all our instructors back here? Well, guess what? They speak multiple different languages. And I want to know what languages they speak. What I can do is inside of, do I have it open here? Inside of SharePoint, I am storing all the languages that my instructors speak. So right now, what I need to do is I need to take their IDs here and then connect it to the IDs here and get the language. So I need to combine it. This is usually in Power Automate, as I've seen it, a complete mess. It's like applies to eaches and conditions. And there's a really straightforward way with the select. Watch this. So what we have to do here is. We're going to use a tool called XPath. Um, before we jump into XPath, has anyone here used XPath? Just give me a yes in the chat if you have. If you have, that's amazing. I didn't really have to touch it until like maybe a year ago. Um, no. Okay, good. I'm, I'd be astonished because like I didn't really use it that much. I think maybe once it, okay, TC, okay, you have a pro code background, Peter, for sure. Um, XPath is, super powerful in Power Automate and like super hidden. Like the, it's not until I saw uh, Paul's Power Automate flow, I um, he had a lecture on it that I really saw the potential of it. Paul, his last name starts with an M. I know I'm gonna butcher it, so I don't wanna say the whole thing. Um, all right, so with XPath, what can we do? If I go in here and I'm gonna open up all my, this flow run, what I'm doing inside of it is first things I'm passing in my instructors once again. And then right here, I am getting all the languages my instructors speak. Okay, cool. And so what does that actually go up because of run? Here's uh, all the instructors. They came in through here. Cool that you've already seen that. I'm getting all my uh, all their data here. If I open it up, cool. Here's here it is here. And then the last thing I'm doing is I'm going to start converting it to XML. Now, XML looks bananas. Here's what you have to do. In this compose, I had to type this up, just type in parentheses, and then I had to type in the word root. And this, I just, you just got to type it. It's how XML works. Like, please don't ask further questions. It's just, you just got to type it out. And then all I did was append, went right into here, 
and I selected my, this is really zoomed in, I selected all my instructors from earlier, put them here. Okay, nothing fancy. The next thing I got to do is I'm going to take that and I'm going to convert it to XML. So, no, I'm too zoomed in. All I did was use the XML function, and then I went in here, and then I typed in the prepare for XML, the thing I did earlier. All right? That's it. And then I'm going to pause right here, and I'm going to show you what that turned into. So if we run it again, we get our instructions. We put out here to XML. Here's that thing I showed earlier, root, array, passed in all this, passed in all the SharePoint stuffs. And then I convert it to XML. What does that mean? Let's pop it into here, paste it, how to format it, and then cool, I have it in XML. Who cares? Well, watch this. If I go in here and then I actually open up, oh, I have it right here. Hold on. I'm going to copy this right here in case I butcher typing this. Um, where is it? Here. Nope. There, expat, cool. If I go up here and I type a dash dash root, okay, I can start selecting stuff. Root, and then I'm going to do array. Okay, well, what else can I do? Using expat, I can start writing expressions and select stuff. So if I paste that, I'm going to do where SQL ID equals seven, and then let's get rid of that. If I just do that on its own, it selected this whole object right here. Just the one where the SQL ID equaled seven, which in this case, it's uh, Ahmed. It didn't select anybody else. And then if I take it a step further, if I come down here and then I actually select, I don't know, languages spoken, it picked Spanish. It picked this person. So now I hope you're starting to see that XPath lets me cherry pick and search on specific values inside of Power Automate in ways Power Automate can't do. This is just an XPath thing. Um, so if I come back here, and then the next step I do is I hop into here, and then I try to do a join statement. Now, the join statement is a little crazy. So here it is. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to open this up and put it right here. And let's zoom in just a tad. I'm using concat. What does concat do? It takes some text and shoves it together. What am I concatting? I'm just concat concatenating this text right here. It's hard coded. And then this text right here. And you've definitely seen this text before because it's the same thing that was in XPath. Yeah, root, array, SQL, root, array, SQL. Language is spoken text. Yeah. The only difference is I am putting in the SQL ID in the middle dynamically. So instead of hard coding seven, I'm doing it dynamically. So when I do that, what I get in my response is let's scroll down. I passed in all the instructors and then I get this. Okay, pretty cool. What does that mean? Let me let me select one of these. Let's select this one. Let's put it here. Okay, this person, the language uh, three, SQL ID three doesn't exist. What about four? Four doesn't either? Ah, fine. Russian. This person speaks Russian. Very, very cool. The next step is if you remember that add property thing we did earlier, what we can do here now is hop over. And then now I'm going to take this concat and I'm going to use this in my add property. So, where in my instructors, if I match on SQL ID, go snag their spoken language. So it looks like this in code. Come on. Come on. Let me click it. There. Cool. I'm going to select this do join, and I have this add property. Let's see what the code actually is. And I will put it down here and make it easier to read because it's way too confusing. Let's back this up. Cool. So I do add property. Item, you saw that before. You saw it when I did it earlier on the credential status, just the item. I want to call the property languages spoken. I'm doing, I'm using XPath, I'm using XML. I'm literally using the same uh, XML, I'm using the same expression I did earlier. So I'm preparing that data I had earlier. That's what XPath. And then XPath is the one that lets me uh, work with the data. 
So here I'm using XPath and I'm pasting in that same thing we saw earlier. So what is it going to do? It's going to take every item in my instructors, attach languages spoken to it, find the matching item from SharePoint using SQL ID, and then it's going to show their language. So if you don't believe that's possible, and yes, I have a video on it. If you don't believe that's possible, if I do select join, here's the gobbledygook I get. And what do I get on the other side? The same nonsense. But if we keep scrolling, look at that. Language is spoken, Spanish. And then if we keep going, all of them, I got it in there. Like, that to me is mind-blowing. The fact that I can connect two data sets, uh, match on properties, and in the end, how much code did I do? If we look here, do you see an apply to each? Because I don't. I see one. We don't even need a We don't even need this statement right here. So, and we don't need this either. So it's one, two statements. Two statements gets us there. And then, of course, we have other statements that we have to get the SharePoint and we have to get the instructor shirt. But that's it. In two statements, I'm connecting stuff. To me, that that's mind blowing power on me. Um. All right. I got one more example. My favorite thing that you could also do is this. I have a bunch of ratings. So let's say that our instructors get scored, kind of like, I don't know, Uber or DoorDash or something. They get scored. So the SQL ID for this instructor first, instructor number two, the rating is four. But then somebody else rated them a two, somebody else rated them a five, but I want to aggregate. I want to sum all these values together. Here's what I can do. If I go down here and then I go compose, prepare for XML, I do the same thing as I did last time, except this is my ratings, not my instructors, it's my ratings. And then here, I'm going to compose it as XML. So you've already seen that. So then my data ends up looking like this. Ratings as XML. Uh, let me select all that. Pop it in here. Format. Cool. And then I'm going to have to change this a little bit. So I'm going to do where seek. Uh, whoops. Let's no elements found. Well, no elements are found because I'm spelling SQL wrong because it's all over here. SQL ID equals five. Nothing. What happens if I do SQL ID equals four? Cool. I got a bunch of values that appear. That's pretty sweet. So great. I got all of the ones where it equals four. But uh, watch this. If I go up here and I type in the word sum, unknown function. Oh, right, right, right. I forgot. I have to do one more step here. And it's not off the top of my memory. Let me go look at it. Sorry, y'all. I wish I had it ready for you. Uh, I'm going to snag it here. Give me one second. And so we can see it. Item slash. Oh, right. I need to actually select that. Okay, that that's what I was missing. Um, XPath here slash rating, and then I put this. Why is it still yelling at me? Um, hold on. This is why demos live are so much fun. Um, root array SQL ID. Okay, let me see that. Um. Unknown system functions, some, uh, oh, wait, is it this easy? Oh my God, it's embarrassing. Uh, so make sure it's lowercase so you don't do what I just did and embarrass yourself. So yeah, sum is lowercase. Look at that. I took everything where the SQL ID is for and I just summed it. How cool is that? I did other stuff. I could do what is a count or make sure it's lowercase. I can do count, I get the number three. I'm doing data manipulation on here, but all that happens is in one row. So if I, Go back here, and then I do what I showed you earlier with um, this add property. But now on add property, it looks really similar to what I did earlier. Um, if I go down here, I did add property. I called it range sum. I'm doing the same thing as the last time with languages spoken, but now I am specifically choosing the rating. And then I'm also doing a sum. So instead of just, oh, match on this language, match on any time the language appears for that person and then summarize that data. So here, if we look down here and I'm curious as to what the total rating is for my instructors, let's go down. If we look at our select now, here's what I put in. Here's the languages spoken, very cool. 
and here's my output. Language is spoken, here's their rating. I know that their average or their total rating is a nine here of all the numbers added together. Or this person got a seven. Like, that's insane. And the fact that, again, I did that, let's go back in here. There is no apply to each. How long does this take to run? Well, let's look. This took zero seconds to run. This took zero seconds, zero seconds, zero seconds. No apply to each, so much less code and runs super fast. Like, that to me is insane. Um, Tina, those are all the demos I have for this wonderful group. I believe I have shown you some ways that you can take Power Automate and make it run a lot faster with some with very, very simple tips and some with more complex stuff. If you want to get in contact with me about this, if you're curious about solutions architecture, because one key thing is just because you, you can do all this stuff, should you? You got to choose when is this appropriate, when is it not to, how is this going to connect to others? This is pretty much all the stuff that it takes to be a solutions architect. If you're curious about that or you just want to um, connect with me on anything, I'm completely open to it. Um, Tina, that, that's what I got for you all. Uh, Tina, I'm happy to keep making stuff up. <laughs> what do the people want? I would love to open the floor at this point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Alexander says, this is great. <laughs> so of course the floor is open for any questions you guys. I don't have a question, but uh, I was just gonna say it was very good. Uh, my head's kind of spinning a little bit, but I enjoy it very much. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Julio, connect with me. I can send you the YouTube tutorials where you just rewind it and it's much tighter than me blabbering and like doing it <laughs> on the fly. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Not related to, to this, but roughly how, well, not related to your solution, but how do you approach Dataverse? And then teams dataverse, dataverse, dynamics. Well, let's not go to dynamics, but the dataverse. How do you approach whether you need the licensing, licensing, whether you need like a dataverse space, uh, whatever they, it's called allocation, or whether you, or, or when to choose a, a per user licensing? I don't know if you're kind of familiar with that topic. No, I am. Um, so yeah, pricing is something that is not straightforward. And as you mentioned, what was your name? Sorry, I missed who was speaking. Alex. Alex, yeah, yeah. Licensing, as you know, uh, super not straightforward. Uh, try out the design first they have made it out. Yeah, for sure. Um, for me personally, there, there's a, a lot of different licensing that's involved. And how I pretty much choose it is first I find out what is truly needed and what isn't. And I specifically think about, usually from the standpoint of like, saving them money because there's a lot of things you can do and you have to be careful with this like the concept of multiplexing like how you reuse licenses like for instance can a service account pretty much accomplish all of it and then do you really need to give everybody access to dataverse so alex that's kind of how i approach it i'm not just like when they say oh we're going to use dataverse does everybody need dataverse why are they using dataverse then we get into power automate and we get into power automate like such as premium then we get into questions like, okay, what are you actually doing in Power On? Do you have developers who are going to be doing a lot of work? Okay, if so, they need licenses. Let's talk about whether it's better to get the subscription or the like per app license. Or is it just a few operations running at a time? If so, do you really need Power Automate? Logic Apps is much more affordable if you're getting into situations where you need a lot of runs but not a lot of power automate maintenance. It might be more appropriate. So Alex, I, I'm sorry, it's situation-based, but what I look at is what are they actually doing in that tool? Do they need the tool? And then what are all the ways that it can work besides what Microsoft is telling me works in the pricing guide? Um, so I wrote right. it down that way. Yeah, that was excellent. You also answered the second question that I wanted to ask about the logic apps. So that was great, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. And then I see in the chat from Kevin, uh, is there a specific license required to try out the design implementation that you have made uh, for the demo? Oh, no, not at all. So Kevin, 
What you're going to do is you're going to hop into here and you're going to type in Power Apps Developer Account. And then you're going to hop into here and then you're going to put in your work email and you're going to get started for free doing all this stuff completely on your own. And if you're like, Sean, I don't have a work email or my company doesn't use Microsoft, you can use your university email. And if your university email doesn't work, then you contact me and we're going to figure out how to put you on my tenant. That's what I do with the some of my students who don't have accounts through work or school. A quick question. Uh, uh, when you develop your solutions, what is your workflow, dev, prod, or UAT, what have you? Do you go, do you carve out a development developer subscription where it's a standalone developer's license with E5, I believe, or something? It's easy to start using the premium features when and then mm -hmm. side, side like slide into premium features when your client may not be using them. And then just wondering about that. Great question. So if I'm using premium features that my uh, company really can't take advantage of later, if it's a situation where they really need to, then like it doesn't make sense. But Alexander, in your case where it's like you might maybe want to try out some features, try out if the premium features are a fit. Well, I would just use the developer plan in my own developer environment and then just try it out like a demo for you. But Alexander, yeah, obviously you might not have that option. In that case, I pressure them to like, look, you can get a default environment for like, I think it's you can get one, it comes with for like $10 a month or like up to 30 and get it just for you so you can play around and experiment. Because I noticed with the premium prom, I see a lot of hacks where you can, and I'm not saying they're bad, I think hacks are great where you can use like how you can populate word templates and use office scripts and never have to use premium word connections like that's fine and maybe that works in your case but as that gets more complicated in those situations i like to have i i ask the company to actually pay for one developer account where i have a premium license so i can show them how much easier it will be that way and then we can assess it whether it's appropriate again i'm not saying hacks are bad i use them it's just like can hacks grow? Can they scale? Right. And then, yeah, I mean, it's all who can support those hacks later on when you move on to, you know. Yeah, I exactly. Who can, I think you bring up a terrific point. Who can support those hacks? I was literally in a situation where somebody wanted to use um, Azure functions to, uh, to pretty much cut licensing costs and jump to logic apps. And my first question was like, very creative idea, that's fine. Can anyone on your team write JavaScript or C-sharp? Because it's going to be a lot more expensive to maintain that versus you just paying like 10, 20 a month. Awesome. And then I'm going to, I know Claudine just posted another uh, question in the chat, but before we get too far into it, I want to invite folks to come on screen really quickly. Uh, give another a second, Sean, because you deserve it. Round of, of applause. And just again, thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, super appreciate you. This has been an awesome presentation. And so thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Thanks, y'all, for coming. Thanks, y'all, for engaging. I know, like, sometimes I like to sit back and just watch a presentation when someone's like, hey, type into the chat. I'm like, can you stop? I don't want to type. I just want to watch. So I appreciate y'all being part of this with me. Oh, thank you so much. And Claudine, since we got you on screen anyway, you want to bring up your question about that best practice method mentioned? Yeah. So, Sean, thank you so much for this. And you mentioned um, that properties should be open for extension, but closed for editing and deleting. Uh, I'm wondering, um, on a practical level for team collaboration, shall we say, in compliance, how do you kind of define, educate, and enforce that? <laughs> That's such a fun question. I'm trying to think if I have like an example of it here. Man, I wish I can. Let me see if I can pull it up here. As I pull it up, I'll just kind of walk you through it. So it's simple. Uh, developers don't follow direction. I say that because I'm a developer and I don't follow direction. I don't want to follow your direction. Like I'm going to do it my way. It's why people make documentation and nobody reads it. The only way I've seen this done successfully is you make a document called do and do not. It's two columns. On the left, you do a screenshot like the select I showed. And on the right, you do a screenshot of how not to do it. 
And then you make the developer's responsibility to maintain that document. That document they will maintain because that document, if they maintain it, makes their job easier. They're not going to maintain a document on how the application works because they know how the application works. And what, they're going to maintain it for the next developer when they leave the job? When they leave the job, they won't care. But what they will care is something that affects their job today. So the do and don't documentation is the only one I've seen remotely come to successful, become successful in terms of getting devs to like follow an actual practice. Yeah, I'm going to try Thank to pull you. up here. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to have time. Um, and I'm going to see. I think I have a very here. I'm happy to answer anything else. Do you do much uh, U of UI design? I mean, I think the automation and the whole that the back end is uh, is good, but how do you like? Do you have to deal with UI? I think that's the, the thing that I want to stay away from. Yeah, Alexander, um, give me a thumbs up if you like Canvas apps and you work in Canvas apps a lot. Can I just can I just get a pulse in the room? Canvas app people, no, good. All right. I'm going to say this. Uh, my UI is garbage and I don't care. So with this, it's like, I think if you have the time and your customer gives you the time to make a really pretty UI in Canvas app, amazing. I love it. I've seen some amazingly beautiful apps. I, I love seeing them. However, Canvas apps, and I would also want to challenge me on it. I've never seen a Canvas app really run an enterprise organization. I've seen a Canvas app do a feature of an enterprise organization, but no, the backbone is going to be model-driven app dynamics or data or something, or Salesforce or something. But like a Canvas app, I, I've very rarely seen it like at that high of a level. So in your case, uh, UI and like a user interface, it's not on my priority list. It never is. I leave that to the people who who know how to do it. UX, I care about that. I care about the user experience. I want them to like find it, like know where stuff is, have it be intuitive. But in terms of have making it pretty, like I would love to show, like I have a green screen behind me. This is what I think pretty is. So, like I'm, it's not my talent at all. So I just I leave that. I leave that to the customers who want to pay for that. And then Arnold actually asked, do you have, can you drop a link to your site again for those courses? Yeah, absolutely. Would love to. Um, I'm pulled up here. Oh, uh, I, I just kind of made this up right now, but I think it's worth it because y'all are great. Um, there's going to be a promo code. Contact me independently uh, because you're part of the Portland uh, meetup group. You get a special promo code that's going to give you 60% off. And I know some of you are like, wait a second, you already said I can kind of like pay what I want. I know, but you can use this to maybe give it someone else if you want to. So yeah, come check it out. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm gonna make the I'm gonna make the promo code's gonna be real. It's gonna be something like uh, Portland volcano or something. I was so, gonna say Mount Saint, Saint Helens, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in fact, I'll do that right now. Use, and I'll make this behind it. Uh, use promo code um, MT Helen. There, there we go. That promo code is going to be real. As soon as this call ends, I'm going to go make it. <laughs> awesome. Well, Sean, I know it's getting late, later into the evening hours over on the East Coast. Uh, one more time, I'd love to invite folks to ask any questions, drop them in the chat. Uh, third, dare I say a third round of applause? <laughs> but again, uh, yeah, really, thank you so time. much. Yeah. And then I'll throw in um, the best practices document mm -hmm. right into here, Claudia, and I finally found it. So here you go. Again, uh, yeah, it's just a template. So you're going to have to force your team to go kind of like, you know, finish it. Thank you. There it is. Oh, thanks, Pat. And Arnold. Oh, Sean's LinkedIn. Uh, it's let me add that here. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, please, folks, get connected. Let's put LinkedIn exists for a reason, right? <laughs> right. 
And here's my LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, what a pleasure to see everybody again. Always nice to see Robert. Great to see your face again, Mark. Always good to see you. Scott, thanks for joining us. Everyone else who joined too, even if you were a little too shy tonight, perfectly fine. Uh, thank you guys so much. Sean, again, huge kudos. Awesome presentation. Great to have you on.